Okay. We are going to start at the beginning. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Sue Condon. Um, this is the third in a um, three part series regarding pelvic floor health. And today's presentation, we're going to talk about listening to your gut. Or the way I like to look at this is what goes in has to come out. So hopefully by the end of today's session, those of you that have some constipation issues um, will be able to help you along with that. So as I was preparing for this presentation today, I found that there's a fun book out there called Everybody Poops 410 Pounds Per Year. Wow, that's impressive. Um, some of you may have more than that, some of you less. So hopefully by the end of today's presentation, you'll have some more strategies if you're struggling in this, in this arena. And I will admit, I have not read this book, but I'm anxious to go check it out and see what it has to tell me. But here was a page from that book that I thought was pretty interesting. It says Americans flush about 200,000 trees of toilet paper per year. And gosh, in the last year, toilet paper has been a hot commodity through the pandemic. So maybe more than that, who knows? So when we think about what goes in and what comes out, we kind of want to follow that pathway um, of how food travels through our system. So it goes into the mouth, of course, down a tube called your esophagus. I'll use my pointer to kind of go around and down. Um, into the stomach. Um, behind this yellow part, it ends up into the small intestine. Usually from the stomach, it's processed in that gallbladder if you still have that intact. And then from the small intestine, it goes in here to the colon or the large intestine, Does this follows this yellow pathway, and then out we come. So how long does it spend in each of those categories? I find this to be kind of an interesting fact. Whoops. We go back, um, that food is actually going to be in your stomach for anywhere from two to four hours, small intestine three to five hours, um, and in your colon it can be up to 10 hours to several days. And some of you may go, yeah, it's in my system a lot of days, more than I'd like it to be. Um, my husband always says that, boy, as soon as he eats something bad, it is right out. Um, and I think that's a little hard to believe because there's quite a bit of processing that has to happen, but maybe something that isn't so good comes out and pushes everything along. I'm not so sure. But I think it's important to understand this time factor because lots of things are happening in our digestive system to basically process that food, break it down into a liquid form, reform it into a solid form, and then hopefully we get it out of our body, the things, the nutrients and things we don't need, but hopefully not too much of it leaves our body. So when you think about healthy bowels, it really does start with eating. Um, and you know what we, the reason this is important is we need to start that gastrocolic reflex in order to stimulate that bowel motion. We've always heard you should eat breakfast. And really this is just another reason. Not only do you need it from the nutrition side of things, but you need it in order to stimulate your bowels to function. So if you're just somebody that grabs a cup of coffee, you're probably not doing yourself any favors if you're having some constipation issues. I know that coffee can be a stimulant to some, but you actually need to be chewing and kind of creating those um, gastric juices to kind of help the process initiate itself. Um, you also want to think about eating meals at a predictable time of day. And I can say personally, like on a weekend, I'm not in the same schedule as I am during the week. So my bowel routine is going to look different on the weekend because I might sleep in an hour later than normal. I might not have the same kind of breakfast that I do during the weekdays. Um, my routine is totally different, and that's okay for a weekend, but if you're constantly changing this all the time, that's going to be um, a, a factor in how your bowels are functioning. And we also want to think about having um, the same amount of food each day. And again, it, I understand if you eat, you know, kind of a bigger breakfast on, say, a special occasion, a Sunday or something like that, but, but for the most part, we kind of want to keep things consistent. 
We certainly want to think about good servings of fruits and vegetables, and we also do want to think about some of those complex carbohydrates. I know we hear all the time, oh, carbs are bad. You know, we've got to stay away from carbs, but there's good carbs out there. Um, it's more of your whole grains, your brown rices, those types of things that are really healthy carbs to consider. And then you want to drink plenty of water. And, and really, you can drink other fluids if you're not a fan of water. But just think about what those fluids are. If you're drinking a lot of soda or a lot of coffee, a lot of those can be um, diuretics um, and, and impact your ability to absorb water efficiently. So, you know, you want to think about, you know, better liquids that are not going to be, you know, pulling water away from you, such as, a, a, you know, if you drink a pot of coffee, yes, you're getting a lot of fluid, but a lot of times with that caffeine and the fact that that's going to kind of dry you out, you're really not helping yourself. So I say if you're not a fan of water, um, buy like a big water container and set a goal that you're going to drink, you know, two of those a day. Um, maybe you can add some lemon to the water. There's some flavorings that you can add to water. Just anything to make you more of a water drinker. Um, I just, I drink water all day long. I'm a, I'm a good water drinker. I'm probably not as good on the weekends and I think that affects my bowel movements for sure. The other thing that healthy bowels needs is they need to be active. Um, and part of the reason for this, if you go back to looking at, I'm going to go back a little bit to all of this in here, we've got to move this food along. And the way that food gets moved is in part the peristaltic activity of our organs. So the stomach having some movement, the intestines having some movement, um, really helps to just kind of move things along the train. So if you're sedentary and you're not very active, you're probably going to find that your bowel function is not as good. And so as a result, that movement of waste through your system is not going to be as efficient. So exercise, walking, activity, getting up periodically, if you have more of a desk job, those types of things are really helpful. I know I have an Apple Watch currently, and it tells me to stand every once in a while. And I think those are good cues for our system. That's just going to help those organs function a little bit better and be good for our overall health. The other thing that you've probably never seen or didn't realize potentially is that in the healthcare field, we like to know what your stool looks like. That's important to us. Um, there's a tool called the Bristol Stool Chart, um, and it gives you the consistency of stool from a type one, which is kind of what I would call your rabbit little pebbles, um, to a type seven, which is more of your di diarrhea type of stool. And the one that we really like the most is right around that type four. And, it, and if you look at that, you'll probably go, oh yeah, that's the one that's the most comfortable coming out. And that is really where we ideally want your bowel to be in terms of formation. Um, if we're up here in this type one, two, or three, you can see that probably looks painful just looking at it because you know that that probably is kind of a harder stool. It's a lot harder to move through the system. Um, it maybe even causes some ripping or tearing or some hemorrhoids coming out. And what's happening here is that the colon is absorbing water out of your stool and not allowing it to be this nice soft shape that we see here. And then sometimes it becomes a little more soft, maybe too soft. And a lot of times what we think of when it becomes like that is there may be more of a bacterial or viral component going on that's causing this. Could be the type of diet, could be something that doesn't agree with your system, whatever the case may be. It doesn't always mean it's bad. It just means that your body's reacting a little differently to it. So again, we're not saying there is a right or wrong. All of these are better out than in, um, for sure. But if you had to pick your favorite type, this is the one that we want. And if you're ever trying to discuss it with your medical providers or your doctor, um, in understanding this stool chart, if they say, tell me about what your bowel looks like, this is what they're probably referencing and probably trying to help you understand. 
it's also important to understand, you know, what does your stool tell you? And again, we don't always look at it. We don't always want to study it. We certainly don't necessarily like to smell it. Um, but sometimes there's important information that we gain from that. So again, if it's hard, we're, we're thinking that the colon is absorbing too much water. Um, maybe you're not drinking enough, or maybe there's a transit problem through the intestinal tract that's causing it to, to move slow. Again, if it's di diarrhea in or really soft, we may have some type of a bacterial thing going on, some type of a food allergy or intolerance. Um, if we've got some bright red stools, we may have some um, fissures in the rectal area that are causing some bleeding. Whereas if it's more of a dark red or black, there may be internal bleeding higher up the chain. And so this is kind of like older um, blood or something that's causing that, maybe some ulcer, an ulcer or some type of intestinal bleeding. So those are things we want to know about. And you want to not just ignore them, you really want to report that so we can get on top of that. And then if there is more of a pale yellow, that may be a pancreatic issue. And again, all of these things are important when you're talking to your physicians. And it's important to talk about your bowel and bladder function if it doesn't feel normal to you because they may not ask. And if they don't ask, you may not tell. So if those are issues for you, you definitely need to tell them. The other thing that's important when we are going to the bathroom is to understand this angle. So you have your rectum here. I'm gonna point up on this upper left picture. And then when there's a ligament that comes around um, this area, this pubal rectus muscle, it's not a ligament, it's a muscle. And it's kind of creating almost like a slingshot look to that. So this angle, which is about a 45 degree angle, that bowel has to go from here and make that turn, so to speak, to come out. And so you will find that in some sitting positions, that may be more of a challenge. So if you get into more of what's called a squatting position, then that angle, because that muscle gets that tension pulled off of that angle, and boy, that can make that stool go out a little easier. Here's another picture down below on the lower right. So again, a little more dramatic here with that puborectalis muscle coming around the rectal, anal rectal angle. And if we go into a squatting position, we just make it a little easier to move things through. Here's some pictures, kind of make that a little more visual for you. Um, when the person's hip angle is at a 90 degree angle, you've got more of that um, turn to make. But if we bring those hips above, um, or the knees above the hips, you can see how we influence that angle. And you can see here with the stool, here's a little better picture of that. Um, they call it a squatty potty. You might laugh at that, but that's actually a real name of this particular stool. And I'm not here soliciting brands. I don't get any kind of kickbacks from squatty potty, but it is probably the one that we will guide patients to first. I will sometimes tell patients, if you've got a little step stool in your house or, or even a trash can, you might wanna try that first before you make the investment just to see. Um, the nice thing about the squatty potty, you can see the shape of it. It can tuck under the stool when it's not in use so people aren't tripping on it. But people, once they found that this device exists, boy, they really find that, you know, that was the, the, the thing that made the difference. So. I encourage anybody that is having any difficulty with going to the bathroom and having an, a successful bowel movement to definitely consider um, thinking about a stool or a squatty potty to help them. The other thing, I'm not a dietitian by background, so um, if you got a lot of dietary questions related to this, I'm not, I'm not that expert, but we know that fiber is a friend for bowel movements. So it can help with constipation, hemorrhoids, diverticulitis, your irritable bowel syndrome. So again, when you start to add fiber into your diet, I caution you to go slow because if you get on this health kick and decide I'm gonna eat a lot of carrots, I'm gonna eat a lot of apples and nuts and whole grains and that, you might start to feel like you're kind of bloated and that can be very uncomfortable. So they're always, we recommend that you start slow um, add a little bit, 
I think breakfast is a great time to add it. Um, and make sure that as you're adding more fiber, you're also getting a lot of fluids in there. Um, there's, there's two types of fibers we think about. We think about the soluble fibers. They form more of a gel. Um, and then your insoluble fibers. And I found this term, soluble is slow, so it kind of helps to you know, absorb things along the track. And insoluble is that go. So they kind of create that bulk and they promote movement. So if I was constipated, I would definitely be adding some of the insoluble to get some of that movement. Um, but if I have some other issues related to cholesterol and glucose being um, high, I might want to bring in some of these soluble um, fibers. And again, this is a good picture and for breakfast of you know, some type of oats, some type of berries, those types of things. Wonderful way to start your day. Um, and again, because you're chewing, that helps that gastrocolic reflex. So if I had to pick the one food that I would recommend you try in the morning, I'd say something with a crunch, even adding some granola to your yogurt if you do or something like that. Throw those berries in. Anything you can do to kind of add that is going to be a great way to start your day and hopefully get things moving. So again, a high fiber cereal fruits and vegetables. Um, I really try to keep, you know, fruits and vegetables and nuts as my snacks. You know, I, I certainly would much rather go and, and get a piece of chocolate, but that my waistline doesn't like that. So, you know, if I can have some grapes on hand, a banana on hand, just some quick things that I can grab, I have a tendency to eat a little bit healthier. And then you can also think about, you know, just getting some wheat bran and kind of mixing that in with act with some of your um, products and that, sneak it into a meatloaf, those types of things. Your family may never know that they're getting more fiber if you do it this way. And it might, it, it might be more pleasing to them and adds a little bulk that way. So those are just great ways to do that. And again, you wanna get away from the white breads and things like that. You really want things to be more that meaty kind of um, fiber filled type of thing to help with that. This chart here just gives you an idea of adding fiber. As we age, we wanna not have too much because we don't wanna get too constipated. And it's important for kids too, because kids poop too. And sometimes they have pooping problems. So some of this you can apply if you know a child that is having issues with this. So let's talk about constipation, because again, we're talking about all the healthy things, but we know there's some unhealthy things. And let's kind of talk through some things that are happening with that. So with constipation, your colon, again, is absorbing too much water, which may mean you're not drinking enough, um, but it also might mean that, that that peristaltic motion through the colon has slowed or become sluggish for some reason, so that time that it's moving through is not very efficient. So again, it can, food can stay in that colon 10, day, 10 hours to several days, so that's a lot of time. And then the longer it stays in there, it becomes hard and, and dry. So um, obviously, we probably don't have to tell you this, if you're straining more than 25% of the time to have a bowel movement, you're probably constipated. Um, I don't get super hung up on number of days between going. I, do, would, I would say that more than three days would be concerning to me, but some people that is their norm. So I'm not gonna just give you an automatic, you've gotta go every day. Um, but I think if you're not going every two to three days consistently, then you may have an issue. I also think there's always issues with maybe you go a little, but you don't go a lot. And there's a lot to do with timing, which we're gonna talk about um, here in a little bit. So, and if, you, and if you're just getting pebbles out those on that Bristol stool scale, that type one, we know that you're probably not emptying um, clearly enough. So this is just kind of showing in this picture here, you know, that's that bowel and it's just sitting there. And sometimes you'll feel like you're like, oh, it's right here. And you can kind of point right to that area um, that it's hurting. And honestly, you know, kind of massaging that area and, and, you know, kind of moving that along, which I'll show you in a little bit, actually can be beneficial for that to help that move along. Because there's something blocking, there might be something that's just not helping it to move. 
sometimes taking a walk. You know, we see it a lot in our hospital patients. If they're not up and walking, they're not having a bowel movement. So we want them up and we want them moving. So again, different causes for different people. Um, it could be a fiber issue. It could be an activity issue if you're not as active. There are medications, any pain medications, a lot of times will cause constipation. So we really encourage people, especially if they've had a surgery in that, use the pain medication, but, but have something on ready because you're probably gonna get some constipation from that. Um, sometimes certain foods, you know, some people have an issue with dairy, some people have an issue with leafy things. Um, you know, if you're having constipation issues, I would definitely track your diet and kind of write down the things that cause you more problems than not, because we may have um, some intolerance issues like a lactose intolerance or something of that nature. And it could do the opposite. It could make things really runny. And so you want to track what you've been eating to know that. Um, actually an overuse of laxatives can cause constipation. There's different laxatives and they do different things. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So, and you know, if you're just constantly doing the same thing with laxatives, you might wanna change up your routine a little bit. Um, I definitely get affected anytime I travel. And again, part of it is my routine is different. I'm not doing the same things that I do during the weekday. I'm not getting up at the same time. I'm not eating the same things, those types of things. So a lot of times my bowels go, you know, kind of just shut down for a day or two. My husband always says, how, do, how can you not go? And I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't feel bad. I don't, it that doesn't bother me. But as soon as I am in route to home or, or at home, things happen. So it's just a comfort level, probably nerves, probably a little anxiousness, um, a little change in my routine, even if I'm having a, a very relaxing time, just, just a different routine for me. Um, and certainly there can be colorectal problems, there can be intestinal dysfunctions, um, we can have irritable bowel syndrome, Sometimes with menstruation, there's some changes that affect our bowels and pregnancy can affect those. So there are so many things that can go into constipation. You almost have to kind of put together a storybook journal um, to understand it further. And again, I think it is good to write down what do you eat and when you eat certain things, what helps more than another and some of those types of things. So I was talking about laxative abuse. So when you go to get a laxative, different laxatives do different things. It's not necessarily a one size fits all. And it's also some people do combinations. So you've got to really read what is the laxative's purpose. So you will see, you know, if, if your neighbor says, oh, I take, you know, Metamucil, it does it for me. Well, that might work for your neighbor if they, you know, they need to increase the, the, the volume of their stool but if your stool is more of an issue with um, it's too dry or hard, you might need this other laxative that helps to reduce you know, that fluid being absorbed. So you might need Miralax or Milk of Magnesia because of that. So um, I, again, I'm not a pharmacist, so I'm not gonna tell you what to use. And I will tell you that you have to just look at what your symptoms are. If your stool is hard, you need more of a lubricant. You might need a combination of these things. So you might need something that helps with reducing fluid absorption. If it seems to be that you get more irritated when you eat certain things, then you might need more of a stimulant. So um, think about what your bowel issue is whenever you're thinking about some of these laxative choices. When I see patients through pelvic floor therapy and they're telling me they have constipation issues or a history of that, I love to give this natural constipation recipe. Number one, there's no medicine in this and, and it's just healthy things. It's applesauce, wheat bran, and a little prune juice. And you make up a, like this little canning jar of this, you put it in the refrigerator, it'll probably last you a couple weeks and you take one to two tablespoons of that. And um, I've had a lot of people come back and go, wow, that worked. So um, I think this is just a, a, an easy thing to start and to try. And hopefully, you know, it might solve the problem. I've told people, you know, why don't you get away from the laxative and try this? Um, I've had patients say that 
they do this every other day or certain times of the day, you know, whatever the situation may be. But I think this is a great option. And again, I like the natural option from that. So again, back to treating constipation, we like it when you increase fiber and fluids. We want you to do that physical activity. We wanna learn some proper toileting techniques. And we've, I've talked about the squatty potty and that anal rectal angle. Um, I'm gonna talk about some th additional things with relation to the pelvic floor muscle. And then having that toileting schedule and routine. Um, and again, uh, we've got the book, Everyone Poops, which is a great children's book. Um, and it's, it's natural to poop, but I don't think we always like to talk about it. So let's talk about um, some natural other things you can be doing to help with constipation. So this, I like these diagrams because this shows that colon and that colon is probably, you know, that's where that stool may be sitting and, and kind of in a pause mode. So just to follow the path of stool. So here was the small intestine. So when the it went, if you recall, we had the esophagus, the stomach actually sits over here to the left side. That's where the, the kind of the holding tank is. And then it gets um, processed down through your gallbladder. Um, and then it enters the small intestine. Um, waste product or, or food product in the small intestine becomes liquefied. So then from the small intestine, it goes through a valve called the ileocecal valve. And then from there, as it, the stool is going to start losing water, which is appropriate, it has to lose, it has to kind of get formed again, and it will travel up, across, down, over, gotta make that curve, that anal rectal angle, and then out the rectum. So if you look at this, there's a lot of turns that things have to make. So we got to go up here, make one turn, up here, make another turn, down here, and make another turn. So easy for things to get stuck if you think about it. So one of the things we like to do is starting in that lower right hand side is to do some just circular massage, you know, just kind of a light pressure and you're just kind of pushing in and doing circles up the colon, across, down, and in. And sometimes you'll find that you feel this kind of this cramping and you might feel it here in that lower right side, or you might feel it over here in this lower left side. It doesn't matter if where you feel it. You might, I've had people say it's kind of up, up under my rib cage. Well, there probably is bowels stuck there and so we may have an obstruction that's, that's preventing it from moving. And so certainly that is something we need to get in to see a doctor about. We may have polyps in this colon that are not helping things move along as well. So again, anything we can do, if you're having a transit problem, this abdominal massage is just another simple way to kind of help. And we oftentimes encourage you to do this after you've eaten and it's not because the food you just ate is there, it's because food is piling up. And so, you know, think about it. If we've got this more food coming in and nothing's going out, we've got a backup problem. You know, we've got some congestion, just a traffic jam. So by kind of moving the, the colon along, we're trying to say the stuff from yesterday and the day before, please move along, because I've got more coming into the system that I need to get processed. So maybe doing, you know, those, those massages of that colon can kind of help the stuff that's there from a day or two ago moving and get that out before the next stuff that you just ate comes through this system. And so this abdominal massage can be really beneficial. Um, it's a good one to teach kids if they're having some problems. I would do, you know, kind of up down, across, you know, maybe do it for about five repetitions, 10 repetitions. Anytime you feel kind of crampy, um, this is really a good way to do that. So that's one simple way that we talk about. I like to show this because uh, understand that scars don't just exist on the outside. Scar tissue is deeper than just the scar that you see on the outside. So if you look at this individual's um, belly, this might have been a hysterectomy. Um, sometimes we see C-section scars along here. 
um, this one down below here. So keep in mind um, for women that have had C-sections, if they have multiple C-sections, they usually go back through the same um, area again and again. And likewise, if later in life they decide to have a hysterectomy or need to have something like that done, they may use again the same area. They're trying not to leave a roadmap all over your stomach if they can prevent it. But every time they go back through this scar over in this lower right hand corner, this is what is underneath there. This is scar tissue, this white stuff that looks kind of like cobwebs, so to speak. These are scar tissue areas. And look and see where, we, where some of these scars might be impacting. First of all, this small intestine, it, it kind of is pulled away here, but it kind of sags down way lower than what it shows. They've just pulled that small intestine up a little bit. Right here where my pointer is in the lower part of the screen, that's the bladder. And so people that have a lot of scar tissue um, may also have some incontinence issues because that bladder is a balloon and it likes to fill up. And if it hits a scar tissue, it's like a roof and it can't expand and grow as much. And so I've had um, patients before that have had some scarring in that area and it's affecting their ability to hold urine. But also think, look at how it's affecting this, this waste product that we're talking about with bowel movements. It's affecting how it's processed through this small intestine. So the best way to, to think about it is think about a garden hose and you kink it. When you kink it, there's a backup. Back here, this water is going, come on, I want to go, and nothing's coming out here. And that's what scar tissue is, is generally doing to the intestinal tract and the colons, depending on the location and the, the pliability of these scars. So, you know, these don't, I mean, they look pretty on her, but yet if you, if I feel them and they feel kind of hard or ropey, that generally was telling me that if it's hard here, it's really stuck here. And so we want scars to be massaged. We wanna break up that tissue. Um, and the way you do that is really with some easy massage techniques that I can do some things on the actual scar. I like to teach patients how to, how to do their own self massage. And we can try to break that up so that we're kind of freeing up these loops and tubes and, and hoses so that things can move through. But I just, I think this is a great example of, look, if we've got some scar tissue over here, maybe a gallbladder removal or something like that, right near one of those um, turns that that bowel has to make to go from this ascending colon across this transverse colon, down this descending colon and out. So scars are really important. And if you work with a pelvic floor therapist, um, that is one thing that we will take a peek at is your belly. Because even though the issue may be down below here, if there are scars or you have a roadmap on your belly or you've had a lot of abdominal or pelvic based surgeries, chances are that scar tissue is causing some transit problems along the way. The other thing that people often don't understand is that when you go to the bathroom, it is actually an act of relaxation. So what that means is that you are not pushing like this woman in the picture is doing. You're not straining. Really, you're trying to just kind of let it go ah, and relax. Um, because if you push or strain, if you watch the opening of the anal or even the urethral opening, if you push or strain, you actually might close those off. Not always, depends if there's some bowel in there, um, but actually that can influence your ability to get things out. So under, to understand this a little further, you've got to understand the brain of the pelvis a little bit. So. The pelvis has two components of the nervous system involved with it, the, the pelvic floor does. There's the voluntary, so I'm over here on the right hand side, the pelvic floor muscle is innervated by a nerve called the pudendal nerve. And so a, a voluntary contraction is I can open and close my hand, I can say to do that, and I can do a voluntary contraction if I can do a Kegel, or I can stop the flow of urine if I'm going to the bathroom and I don't have to really go. So there is some voluntary control over the pelvic floor. 
A healthy pelvic floor is the ability to contract, relax, push out, relax, contract. That's that full range of motion. So we want you to keep your pelvic floor in good muscle tone, not only to hold back urine or hold back bowel when it's not appropriate, but also to help with good evacuation techniques. But the other part is the involuntary part. And so what this is, is the bladder and the rectum have kind of a constant tone around them. There's a muscle kind of tone caused by the involuntary system. The involuntary system is also responsible for your heart beating, your lungs breathing, your stomach digesting. You don't tell it to do those things, they just, it just knows to do it. So with pelvic floor, that involuntary contraction at the rectal area and at the bladder area is kind of a hold mode all the time. Otherwise, you would just be pouring out. So people that have had a spinal cord injury, um, young babies that don't have that pelvic control yet, things just can come out. So as our nervous system evolves and it develops, that you develop two components. There's two tracks, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic, you think of as your fight or flight response. So when you hear the term, I was so scared, I thought I was going to pee my pants. That's sympathetic fight or flight. So sympathetic tone is, is holding. It's a hold mechanism. The parasympathetic is that urge mechanism. So when you, your bladder, I'm gonna use your bladder before I use your rectum, but when your bladder starts to fill, you're gonna get a signal that goes to the brain that says, Sue, you might wanna go to the bathroom. Well, I'm in the middle of talking to you. I can't leave right this minute. So I'm gonna say, no, not right now. I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of a, of a meeting or I'm driving home. So that signal comes and it goes away. And that's, that tells that sympathetic system to just hold on, don't, don't let go. But when I get to the point where I'm ready to go, I'm done, um, I'm gonna walk to the bathroom, I'm gonna pull down my pants, I'm gonna sit down on the toilet and I'm gonna have that oh, feeling. That's relaxing. And what's happening is that sympathetic tone is letting go because it's safe to let go and it wants to let go. So when I say going to the bathroom is a, is a form of relaxation and that feeling of, oh, that's that sympathetic system. So with, the, with it relating to the rectum, you're gonna get a, a, a signal and I want you to pay attention to this in the days to come. You get that signal in the morning, potentially, that you need to go and have a bowel movement. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm late to work, I can't go. And somehow, some way you get to work and you forget and you don't go to the bathroom. And then later in the day, you think, I didn't go to the bathroom today, I didn't poop. I might have, I might have potty, but I didn't go to the bathroom. So with, with rectal, and I don't know why this is, you're gonna get that first sensation of it's a good time to go and then there's a good chance you're not gonna get it again that day. Or it's, if you get it, it's not gonna be very strong. So in the, in the training that I've been in, we were told that is the best time. So that's why in the morning, um, and I don't know if it's always morning for people, but I think for me it is, I, I like to build in a little extra time. So it, you need about a half hour at least, I think of extra time where you're, kind of moving around, you're maybe getting some breakfast, you're not in a rush, you're not in a hurry. Here comes that signal that says you might want to go to the bathroom. That's the time to go because chances are that bowel is there, it's ready to come out, you're going to get all of it out and it's going to be a, a much um, more efficient time to get rid of it and then you're probably done. Some people go multiple times of the day, but I would say for the majority of us, it's a, it's a one time a day affair. So you really want to listen to that signal when it comes to the bowel. It's a little different for bladder. Um, bladder, we don't always want to feed into that signal because we want the bladder to learn holding capacity and the bladder will talk to you a lot more all day long than the bowel is going to talk to you. So the, think of the bowel as giving you one little knock, knock, knock 
and that's the time to go. So if you have, are one of those type A, kind of rush around type of people and you're not giving yourself that time and you tell me you're constipated, I'm going to tell you, you've got to give yourself some time. But if you're one of those people that goes to the bathroom all the time, urine wise, I'm going to tell you something a little different because they operate just a little bit different from that. So that's kind of what this is showing. Type A people are goal oriented. We like schedules. We like control. Um, I'm that person. I can tell you I'm that person. But once I learned a little more about listening to my gut and that bowel sensation, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Um, and so I really started to incorporate that more. Other things, you know, some people need to just go sit on the throne and just sit for a little while. And that's okay too. That works for some people. That's their routine. So don't get upset if your husband or somebody in your family likes to go take a magazine and go to just sit on the bathroom because they need that, that extra time and that relaxation to kind of get things moving. And so they, they allow themselves that amount of time. So ways to relax include breathing exercises, some body mind things. I think working on understanding that pelvic floor contraction and that push out the push out or the protraction isn't necessarily what I want you to do to have a bowel movement, but it's kind of what we do, but it's more of a relaxation of the pelvic floor. So a little bit more from that book I was telling you about. Um, it says, think of poo as the quintessential reject of all the food that goes into your body, a remarkable small portion ever comes out. So what is it made of? 75% of it is unused water, 10% is dead bacteria, 10% is indigestible food like fiber. Think of your corn that doesn't um, process down. And 5% of it is alive, well, it's a living bacteria. So the things we didn't use. So, um, and I would say happiness definitely is the ability to poop. Um, you feel a lot better from there. So wishing you all a happy ending, no pun intended. Um, I think we can open it up now for questions if I can get to that screen. So let's see, I think I've got it open. We don't see any questions mm -hmm. right off the bat. Um, if you have some questions, go ahead and put them in the chat function. Good. All right. Anybody have any questions? All right. Well, if you do and you want to email us, you, we can certainly, oh, how does acid reflux affect the gut? You know, I, 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 don't, I would say that it has to do more with, there's probably some type of a blockage from that esophagus down into the stomach. A lot of times, um, I don't know what produces that, but usually what, I, what I've what i heard people say is that you have to be a little more elevated when you sleep so um, so that you're not laying so flat. But I, I, I don't, you know, I don't have all the answers on all of that. That's kind of higher than what I'm, I'm used to dealing with. Any other questions? I think they will be able to send you a copy for sure. So that way you'll have um, the details. And I just want to add that, you know, we have pelvic floor therapy here at North Kansas City Hospital. I'm a physical therapist. There are also occupational therapists. We all work as a team together in our department. So um, we certainly welcome you. Um, to get in for pelvic floor therapy, you just need to get a referral from your doctor. You don't need to go to a specialist necessarily. Um, and I would say this is the simple way to start. And certainly if we don't feel comfortable with what we're seeing, we're going to get you to that, you know, ask you to go see a specialist. So very good. Well, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.